Hi, I'm Dr. Derek Lee. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Sponseller. He's the Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and serves as Chief of the Division of Pediatric Orthopedics at Johns Hopkins Children's Center. Dr. Sponseller is the Deputy Editor for Pediatrics for the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and past president of the Scoliosis Research Society. He has served on the board of directors of POSNA. He is a staff physician at the Kennedy Krieger Institute and consulting physician at Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital. Dr. Sponseller has also published more than 300 scientific papers and has written or contributed to numerous books, book chapters, and articles. Today, we're gonna to talk to the doctor about diasport, which is botulinum toxin A, as an adjunct treatment to bracing in the management of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Welcome, doctor. Yes, thank you, Dr. Lee. It's great to talk to you about this topic, which is a, a research passion of mine. Well, there's been quite a bit of interest in this particular topic. If I take you back maybe a couple of years, what was the initial trigger for your interest in this particular uh, uh, treatment option? My interest was triggered by the fact that Scoliosis conservative treatment has undergone a, a resurgence of interest, especially since the BRACE study. But bracing only works in uh, avoiding surgery in a portion of the instances in which it's used. And the initial correction in BRACE is about 50% to 60% in general. And so we're looking for ways to try to make it more effective. And given the fact that scoliosis is kind of an anterior column overgrowth and posterior column is relatively unperforming, underperforming uh, posterior part of the spine is underperforming. We thought that perhaps Botox injected into the concavity posteriorly would help to provide some increased balance between those opposing forces and perhaps would allow a better correction over time. And there was some small amount of research evidence for this from a Scandinavian study that showed uh, the benefit of Botox when used posteriorly as well as in the iliopsoas. So we, we were uh, successful in getting this idea supported by our IRB, or at least allowed by our IRB. And we were fortunate to receive research support from Ipsen Pharmaceuticals, who's a maker of Diasport. Uh, and it's a prospective randomized study in which we have a two to one randomization of active drug versus placebo given injected on two different occasions in actively growing children versus zero, one, or two with curves between 20 and 40 degrees Cobb angle. Can you explain a little bit more of the demographics of the study in terms of how many kids are involved in the program and in a control group, et cetera? Yes, our target enrollment was 90 total participants, which would be 30 placebo and 60 active drug, but of course it's randomized. So um, it could be slightly more, slightly less in each group. Okay. How close are you to the end of the study actually? We're about three quarters of the way through. Uh, as you can imagine, a lot of teenagers are not interested in adding any more complexity to the treatment besides the brace, because the brace is initially a heavy left for them psychologically. And getting an injection on top of that is uh, sometimes sometimes not uh, accepted by them. But many of the more uh, thoughtful kids and families are interested in doing whatever it takes to give the best chance of success. And with the hope that this study may show positive results, they're willing to undergo the Botox as an adjunct to it. And of course, there's no additional cost to them for the study since it's supported by the, the company. Okay. Are all the um, participants uh, through your center? Yes. Uh, because of the need for IRB approval and, and IRB monitoring, it's just a single center study, which gives us control of how it is uh, discussed and monitored and performed. What are your parameters for giving the in injection in terms of how far apart between, between delivering the uh, diaspora? The protocol is written up to have just two injections, um, four months apart, and then the patients are followed to maturity i.e. risk of four or five. Um, if this initial cohort showed an effect, I would be interested in extending it to more injections over time uh, and to uh, get insurance approval for offering 
to, to more and more patients? Parameters are RISR between RISR 0 and 1 and between 20 and 40 degree Cobb angles. Uh, are these primarily for lumbar curves, double curves? Actually, they're for all types of curves. Uh, and as you, as you know, thoracic curves are the most common type of curve. So the preponderance are thoracic curve with the next most common being double curves or thoracolumbar curves. What type of bracing is being currently used with, with the participants? Is it um, Boston 3D, Rigo Cheneau? It's a Rigo style Cheneau brace um, made by the National Scoliosis Center most commonly or by any other orthotist who has experience with scoliosis. Okay. And what's their um, wear time and brace in general? Or on, on an average, I should say. We recommend we recommend uh, 20 to 22 hours per day. And we have wear timers in most of the braces. And so we can record how much is actually being worn. Um, and of course, as you know, with that recommendation, usually the actual wear time comes out to an average of about 16 to 18 hours a day by the recorded thermal sensor, I button. Uh, Dr. Sponsor, can you take me through the actual um, process of um, the injection, where it's injected? Because the, the study protocol indicates that the con concave portion of the curve, why was that chosen over the convex, that type of thing? Because the, the goal is to have less muscle activity on the concavity posteriorly so that uh, the forces of growth um, can be the, for, the forces that are causing anterior column overgrowth uh, will be more evenly distributed and balanced across uh, the, the posterior column, which will then be hopefully less, less force um, and will allow the spine to balance more evenly. We try to go about one to two centimeters lateral to the spinous process and infiltrate the paraspinous muscles over a two centimeter range from the apex above and below. Uh, so there's several injections depending on the levels you need to span? Yes, usually one skin injection is fanned out approximately just the medial and lateral. And sometimes depending on the length of the curve, we use a second site next to that. Okay, because interestingly, when, when I first heard about this study, I was very much interested in why you, you inject on a concave side because you'd figured there'd be more uh, muscle tone, muscle tension on the convex side. So it's very, uh, it's, it's almost the opposite. It is the opposite. Is that the case? Um, on the, the convex side, um, we would like to have more muscle tone and tension, a relative balance, so that um, the forces um, will balance out and promote growth, uh, promote. Um, even force across the, the whole spinal unit, medial to lateral and anterior to posterior. What's the mechanism that the dye sports uh, actually, what does it actually do its action? Its action is very similar to botulinum A toxin and it inhibits acetylcholine up uptake at the neuromuscular junction as, as it does in, as Botox does in all of its applications. Okay, so it basically relaxes the muscles in that area. Yes. Okay. Uh, anecdotally, what kind of results have you seen so far? We've seen, of course, it's randomized. So we have seen many kids who are successfully taken through the whole growth period without needing surgery. And so we, we hope that many of those are the Botox patients. Some of them with larger curves that would be high risk for surgery and and some of them have gone through and uh, avoided surgery and even ended up with slightly lower curves at the end of maturity. Um, but of course, we're very anxious to get to the end of the study so we can break the code and find out which, how well the placebo and the active drug cohorts did with respect to each other. Are there any risk factors for using this pr procedure in terms of does the... Uh... Does the dye spore leak into other tissues? The usual risks of Botox and dye spore 
include a uh, lack of effect over several injections and sometimes a flu-like syndrome that can happen. And there have been some reports of swallowing study, swallowing difficulties in some patients who have gotten Botox. Um, but we have seen very few, if any, side effects called into us after the, the drug is given. Um, and uh, another side effect is the fact that after multiple injections, it may fail to perform. Nobody knows exactly what the long-term outcome of muscle, who is, which is injected with Botox, is. But there's enough anecdotal use that has been gone has been done over the last ten years that it seems to be free of any serious long term side effects on the muscles. Oh, excellent! Uh, if the data look really good, do you see this being a treatment for um, more mature spines? Do you see this as a potential, or do you only see this as a potential treatment for AIS during the growth spurt? Uh, I think the sweet spot is during a a time that's time limited and can basically guide and influence the growth of the spine so that at maturity, it's in a better state than it would have been. That's the goal of bracing, and that's also the goal of vertebra body tethering. However, uh, nobody knows what interventions done to a mature spine will do holding up over time. If bone, if mature bone has a chance to remodel or the mature spine has a chance to modulate itself, then that would be a more sensible long-term option. Um, and I don't think that that has actually been shown, but it is possible that mature bone may uh, remodel and model itself um, to be permanently influenced by some of these treatments. Do you see a potential um, adjunct to vertebral body tethering with uh, diaspora injections as well? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think. Um, that would be a, a boon if it could be done. Uh, I think that would give you something to do in the posterior space to, to balance what you're doing in the anterior space and maybe peruse better 3D correction, better sagittal performance of, this, of the spine uh, because the tether has not been shown to produce as much through rotation as a posterior instrumented spine. It hasn't been shown to produce significant um, increase in the sagittal plane uh, and that's, of course, what one of the things we want is to have a restoration of a more normal sagittal contour in these AIS patients. With respect to uh, early onset scoliosis and casting and bracing, uh, do you see any potential uh, impact in that space? I think so. I think these young, actively growing kids with a very mobile spine and highly responsive tissues to the forces upon them would be a great a great um, place to look at offering it, um, especially since they're asleep during the beta casting and, and the Botox can be injected without the fear factor that and, and the anxiety factor that typically accompanies an injection in an awake juvenile or adolescent. Um, I know my questions are kind of jumping all over the place, but uh, as we talk, I'm just asking, getting more questions and popping into my head. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, spine flexibility is huge in terms of potential uh, curve progression or even uh, curve reduction in bracing. Have you also um, taken into account spine flexibility through this study, initial flexibility, or do you quantify that more with the in-brace correction as opposed to bending x-rays? We have not taken bending x-rays or any kind of flexibility x-rays as part of this study. So. Uh, perhaps uh, a way to control for different degrees of flexibility, maybe look at the first embrace correction um, and see if we can tease out spines that are responding more because of their innate increased flexibility versus the effect of the drug. And we probably would have to have a lot more patients to be able to tease that factor out. But if we see an effect and go to expand our population, that would certainly be one thing to incorporate in the set of variables that we look at. Uh, I guess one last question. You mentioned before that there has been interest in this particular study, um, and I I feel that you're encouraged by the results uh, so far. Even though it's a randomized controlled trial, you're probably seeing things that anecdotally um, seem positive. Uh, do you have any uh, comments? 
Yes, I mean, I think that people who are volunteering for the study are really just contributing to our knowledge base. And once we have enough to meet our power, our power is set, uh, we will, uh, power parameters, we will be able to hopefully provide more evidence for whether this is really an effect that uh, is working as well as we hope. And um, I'd say that uh, it, we appreciate everybody who is volunteering for the study and would like to have as many enrollees as possible um, so that we can give actual science to what we feel is a promising hypothesis. Dr. Sponsor, on that note, is there a way for potential uh, volunteers to contact you regarding the study? Who'd like to participate? Yes, uh, through my email, which is psponse at jhmi.edu. And we'll be happy to just discuss it either online or with a phone call. Excellent. Okay. Dr. Sponsor, thank you so much for your time. It's a really interesting um, approach to uh, helping, helping any you. treatment with EIS. Really appreciate your time. For, uh, I know you're in between surgeries as well. Thank and you for the chance to discuss this and explain it further, Dr. Lee. Appreciate it.